presentation and I have to say it resonates with many of the issues that I have encountered myself so from a perspective I feel comfortable sharing the event which was one of my biggest fears actually so one of the things that I have found and maybe next time we run together we can cover that I found myself also dividing um, cases between low intensive cases and fact intensive cases and I see pretty much uh, this issue arising in here so you have transfer pricing which would be fact intensive and which are not covered in this case, in, in this book, and then you have the law intensive cases which are the ones that you're covering in the book. So if that's correct, it could be an interesting route to, to explore for the, um, for the future. And another issue that I found interesting is, is about the fact that uh, the law disappears and maybe across the board. I mean, we have developing alternative methods of addressing disputes or conflicts that may lead to the fact that courts progressively uh, disappear. So I found that um, very, um, very, very interesting. And well, when thinking about how to structure the discussion, I think I was discussing with Eduardo, and the best idea we came up with is to divide up because there were so many ideas and there's so many different issues that I think it might make sense actually that we start with this discrete question about arbitration, so what it means for the future, how it relates to the topic. I mean, so then is this relevant uh, to the topic of the book? And so far, you're covering law intensive cases. Uh, what is the, I mean, what is going to be the future of research, which is one of the issues that uh, Ruben covered. So I propose uh, to, the, um, to the audience that we start actually with this issue of arbitration that has been touched upon in one way or the other, and that is now fresh in our minds, before we move on to other topics. So then, any questions or comments on this discrete question on arbitration in the future? Uh, Vernon, yeah. Well, thanks so much for all the Thanks so much for all the presentations. I'm not going to look into that, am I? Uh, I'm looking at you, the, the, the speakers and people on comms. Um, arbitration, and uh, there was the, uh, Ruben had the, the idea that, that the fear that we might be losing courts as a matter of arbitration. I'm not that pessimistic. That no, I, I wrote the, the German chapter. There are lots of cases. I don't see those going away either because effectively arbitration is only offering an additional route for the taxpayer to is especially go there for the fact-intensive cases that they don't really want to have decided by a judge. And I don't think it's true that the judges don't really like it, but the judges have no choice if it comes to them. But it's for the taxpayers. They don't want it uh, adjudicated by a judge who has no economic training, doesn't really want to deal with it, and really has not the right training to deal with it. So they are more interested in having an arbitration. If they're actually coming up with uh, problems that are legal in nature, they go to the courts, and the courts will remain relevant to, to set uh, precedent cases. So I don't think there's a great likelihood of, of it changing. What would be interesting to see in, the, in future research is how it may change the types of cases that go to courts compared to those that we'd rather put to, to arbitration panels. An interesting question that I'm sure Eduardo will be interested in is, what is going to be going on in the sort of competition between arbitral panels and courts? Are courts going to offer a better deal to taxpayers compared to arbitrators? Will they do that? Because it's the taxpayer who decides where they want to take the case. So presumably, if I don't want to lose my relevance as, as a court, I have a, an incentive to make sure the taxpayers still bring cases to me instead of going to the arbitrators. And the arbitrators in the same, in the same, at the same time may have a competing objective to have cases come to them. So that's, I think, going to be an interesting issue for the future look at, but I don't think courts are going to lose uh, relevance. And just one, qu uh, one question I had uh, to, to Sophia on whether that was discussed, and it just came up to me now, so it may be um, not that uh, relevant and maybe easy to answer. But have you looked at, uh, from the European Union law perspective, as to whether the outcome or the I giving effect to an arbitral award may be problematic from a stated perspective? Because it doesn't seem to be that obvious that the outcome from an arbitration case, especially when it comes to transfer pricing, is really the correct result, the arm's length compatible result. Especially in baseball arbitration, if we have very different proposals, it's very unlikely that one of them is going to be really the correct outcome. It may be one that's fine for both uh, administrations and for a taxpayer, but 
the way the European Commission is now implementing the arms length principle into EU law and forcing member states to enforce that principle may become problematic if they're actually accepting a result that may not be 100% in line with the way the European Commission understands the arms length principle. I don't know whether that was at all discussed in the OECD. I'd be interested to hear about that. Perhaps if you want to pick up on that. Yeah, the EU law is, is uh, it, it's funny because <coughs> when, when Working Party 1, who's dealing with the model and arbitration and everything, is, is meeting, th there's, there's the meeting not with the EU, they meet meeting with each member of countries. But um, yeah, the EU law often comes as, you know, a, as, as one thing that is it's puzzling <laughs> a lot of non-EU countries, and, and there is a bit of history there. But I think that the, um, the EU is coming with its own directive on arbitration. Mm -hmm. And I think the, uh, the method they're using is different. And the, um, uh, they could, um, the, it's a, in, in the MLI and in, in the OECD, it's a state-by-state -state process that the taxpayer doesn't get to. If, if let's say, any time during the process, if the two competent majority agree, finally, then then they agree, and that's that's the result. Uh, but it, sometimes they can also agree not to take the case forward in mm -hmm. arbitration. If they both agree, that's uh, the case doesn't go to arbitration, and the EU directive is taking a different approach. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's it more it engage more with the taxpayers. It's less a state to state. So. Mm -hmm. I, and, and you raise a good question. I don't know what will be the interaction. I expect that once the directive is final mm -hmm. and agreed upon, then then EU dispute will be resolved within the EU within that directive. But if if the UK, uh, well, uh, the UK is not a good example. Sensitive issue. But um, if France has a dispute with the US. Um, well, the U.S. is not part of the MLI, so that's not a good, but you have arbitration with, with France, but Canada. And, yeah, and Canada, okay, good. Uh, so they, they have a tax dispute with Canada. Well, the EU law should not have an impact on that dispute resolution. Oh, it does. It does with the state aid. See, th this is what... Uh, uh, this is what countries <coughs> outside the EU say, well, deal with it within the EU. We, you know, we, we are resolving dispute. And the fact is that it happens right now mm -hmm. if the competent authority agree. But, uh, let's leave out arbitration. Mm -hmm. If the, the competent agree on something, is it state aid? It, it can easily be, yes, of course. Well, then, <laughs> then we have the problem now, so or we like had it for many, many years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a new law problem, no question about that. It's yeah. just that it, it, it creates a layer of difficulty <coughs> to something that otherwise looks neat and perfect. You know, we have the solution there, except that there are, there's EU law as sort of a sort of <coughs> constitution layer above that, and there may be constitutional problems with other countries in how that can be given effect as well. And that's just, uh, and I say this from as uh, from the perspective of writing the the German chapter. There's often uh, there's a history of, of of cases where the German tax administration agreed on something with the competent authority of another state, and the court statement said, no, you can't do that because we have the authority to decide what the tax treaty means, and you can't give a different meaning to a treaty by just agreeing this is what we always thought it means. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of a competition there going on between the administration at the courts, the courts not wanting to give up their uh, their say or what the law is. I mean, in the end, it's a question of the rule of law. You don't want the administration to give uh, too much power there. And I agree entirely with you to the extent that it's a, a matter just of facts. That shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. But, yeah. but also, I think one element to arbitration is that the taxpayer could always choose to follow arbitration or go to court. And, that's and my first point, right? that's so, the so then mm. if he's not happy with the result and you think he could invoke the state aid and go to court, well, he'll go to court and he's going to win in Germany, for example, but he's, got, he's going to be in double taxation because Canada would not 
agree. I mean, so there'll be a yeah. discrepancy between yeah. the, the, the national German result and the out non-EU result. Arbitration tried to realign those things, but the taxpayer always has the choice to use the best of the two options. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's something that favors taxpayers. Mm -hmm. It's intended to do so. I mean, I think one <coughs> analogy may be uh, to what will happen with arbitration, and that supports your more optimistic <coughs> view to some extent, uh, is what happened with transfer pricing in the US. So, you know, I. Uh, read all the transfer prices cases through the or through the 95 regs and the OECD guidelines, and there were hundreds and hundreds of them, and there were hundreds and hundreds of pages each. And then after that, for a long time, there were no cases at all. For almost 20 years, there were no cases, and the reason was that you know a lot of cases went to advanced pricing agreements, which is somewhat similar to arbitration in the sense that it's a negotiation between the taxpayer, and it can be bilateral or multilateral, uh, more than one jurisdiction can be involved, and I think that was a success. The, the, the issue, though, was that some taxpayers, because taxpayers tended to win the cases when they were litigated, you know, they didn't really want to go to APAs, and now, suddenly, in the last two, three years, we see an increase in litigation again. So we have, you know, at least one decided case and several other in the pipeline that are likely to be decided. And this is despite, and, and one reason that, for example, the US Canadian arbitration or similar things don't apply is because these cases are invariably between the US and tax havens. I mean, the profits are shifted to Puerto Rico, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no, and with Puerto Rico, of course, you can't have arbitration because it's like it's not a state; <laughs> it's not a country. So you know, basically, because of that, I think that transfer pricing litigation, at least, is not that. I mean, that, that's that's why I would be less concerned about stay hate mm -hmm. because you, if you've got an arbitration, that's an agreement between two countries. It's, it becomes an allocation of taxing responsibility. So I, I mean, that, particularly given the jurisprudence of, uh, of the ECJ on. on on tax treaties, I think it, it gives less opportunity for the state aid mm -hmm. argument, uh, quite apart from the, the fact that there are you know, weaknesses with the whole state aid argument anyway, which may un unravel in, in, in the future. Uh, one in, I think the more interesting point are the, the points of differences between the EU directive and, and the MLI approach, particularly on transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, so the, the EU directive has requirement for transparency, a uh, requirement for, for publication, uh, at least of a, a summary, and, um, and has a, a requirement, and it, it looks as though it's intended to override anything in treaties. <coughs> so if you have a, a treaty between two EU countries that provides for arbitration under the MLI, for example, the directive seems to require that they use the directive approach rather than the approach in the treaty. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to see you know, these, these two very different conceptions because it, I, I wonder how many of the 160 treaties are in fact between EU members, which would then be overridden by the directive. That's right. That's right. Uh, because the directive is, is now in force, is, is now finalized, and it's supposed to come into force next year. So it will in fact affect the UK, which is another yeah. interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, no, but that's the question. It will affect the UK. What happens when we get to 2019? Will the UK then <coughs> disavow that or incorporate it into its treaties, or, or, or what happens? That's another uh, another question. Uh, can I just come back to the factual point? Because I'm not sure that uh, your argument, we don't need precedent in factual issues, is, is so correct. And if I go back to my uh, law school days in, in Canada, Neil Brooks, my professor, had this view of, of, of residence residence cases and say they're, they're all factual none of these none of these <coughs> cases are, are relevant in the precedence I mean, most of those were, were U UK cases <coughs> and uh, although they were clearly factual they were seen as creating precedence and indeed uh, the, the new statutory rules that the UK has adopted has incorporated some of this doctrine that supposedly came out of these, these factual cases so uh, Factual cases can still create precedents, and, and one reason for it, apart from what judges 
the way judges work uh, in, in common law jurisdictions, is this question of certainty. So, you know, as, as, as Sophie said, that the reason we got the, the map element of the BEPS was because of a concern for taxpayers for certainty. And if you have an arbitration process which is completely opaque, that doesn't provide a lot of certainty and attractiveness for taxpayers. So taxpayers may welcome the speed of resolution, but if they have to go into it not knowing what's going to come out the other end, that makes it less attractive. So there's that balance between it. And, and you know, even with factual issues, you know, it's nice to know that, that factual issues of this sort, you have a reasonable chance of success. So even with factual issues, there is, some, there is more scope for precedent setting than, than might at first appear. So I think, I think there's a real tension there. Uh, we'll have to see how that, that's resolved. And, and um, one can see why governments wanted to make the, the MLI arbitration process non-transparent. But the fact that you've got the competition from, from the EU directive, it's going, to, it's going to be interesting to see how that works out. Okay, so unless Sophie wants to point out something, or no, I, I, I agree that um, you know, it will be interesting. But the danger in the EU with that directive is that you'll see two, two, two stream of precedent setting. Mm. One that is judges that have been trained and, you know, and named or uh, um, to, uh, to, to, to make the law and set those precedents. And then you'll have another stream of who will be precedent setting? Who, who are these people mm. on the arbitration panel? Who are they? And then that's, you know, yeah. in, do you want <coughs> these people that are named by government? And, you know, and then the, the, the two named person, name and third one, do, do you want them to set the law of the land? Mm. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. The, countries, the majority of the countries, and that's why they, in, in the MLI, they said, we don't want that. We, our target is quick, efficient resolution of the dispute. We don't want to create a different body to create those uh, and interpret those. Uh, I'm not saying, uh, like a treaty of use, for example, what's an abuse? Well, it's highly factual. Yeah. And that country want the court to decide on that because it's, it's, it may, it's, it's viewed as a big question of law. Mm -hmm. And, and it, there should be court, you know, deciding on those very important issues. Transfer pricing is viewed as an economic, factual thing that should be resolved by countries. And, and, and quite frankly, I don't think the courts are interested in setting precedent <laughs> in those cases. So it, it's a, you're right, it's a much, complex issues when, mm. y but t there's a lot of fascinating issues and, and, yeah. and policy issues. Yeah. Is, let, let me offer um, something that I would call a law and context approach to, to arbitration. Um, I think it's important to, to take into account the, the big picture we have been discussing according to which there has been a Copernican revolution. Countries are competing in a very, I mean, harsh way for capital. So my feeling is that countries, I mean, are not interested in producing uh, co legal coherence in this uh, in this area. They are basically trying to maximize the attraction of, of capital, basically. So this is this is this distinction between question of fact and question of law. I think is subject could be subject to manipulation uh, because. In many cases, it is not clear whether it is a question of fact or is a question of law. It is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is that the net effect of this uncertainty between question of fact and question of, of law will effectively create room for forum shopping. So it will forum shopping. It will uh, allow taxpayers to do a forum shopping between maps and arbitration or courts. So the net effect of this uncertainty is to create a, a global forum shopping arena so um, taxpayers will, will choose either map or courts, depending on what is more convenient for them. Um, my feeling, taking into account the, I mean, some US experience I mean, and history, is that probably the map and arbitration avenue will be the favorite one because it is confidential. 
And if that is the case, using a public choice approach, my concern is that there could be a systemic conflict of interest. Because my feeling is that most tax arbitrators will be, at the same time, tax advisors. So um, my concern is that the net effect of this arbitration, tax arbitration, is the creation of a, of a massive conflict of interest. And we, on Monday, the arbitrator is a lawyer, is playing as an arbitrator. On Saturday, or on Friday, a tax advisor. So there could be a severe problem of, I mean, emerging from this conflict of interest. So the question is, what can be done? And uh, probably, probably the European Union may offer a, a potential response to, could be, I mean, to make arbitrations public across the board, option one. Option two would be to, to learn from Chile and South Korea, in the sense that these two countries are creating an incentive on taxpayers and countries to make maps public. And that, I think, would be my favorite option. So rather than following the EU approach of transforming um, arbitration uh, public in, in all cases, <coughs> probably, um, as far as I can see, the best available method would be to, to create I mean, a system according to which both countries and taxpayers are induced to make their uh, maps public, and hopefully to, to send I mean, to use maps as a, as a laboratory to, for the creation of new regulations that could be sent to the OECD and create a global database of new regulations that could be facilitated cross-country learning. So um, to make the story short, what I can see is that this distinction of between question of fact and law is in many times uh, unclear. So the creation of, of uh, global forum shopping will probably be created. My prediction is that uh, international investors will normally prefer map and arbitration because it is confidential. So, uh, and the problem of systemic conflict of interest, which can be seen in the area of probably bilateral investment treaties. So, that's something that I think is uh, happening there. So, what could be the solution is optional publication and learning from the Ch Chilean mm -hmm. and South Korean regulation on how to induce the relevant parties to make them public. If I may ask you something regarding on that. So what Sophie had been identifying, which is quite interesting, is the, the fact that it, uh, a duality of precedent, uh, du a dual body of precedents could emerge. Yes. Would you see that as a problem, that you would have two different bodies, let's call it administrative, uh, let's I call see. It judicial, so then would that be an issue? I mean, as, as Sophie was, would, it be, would that be desirable in your view? I think just be a problem. I think we may learn from, I'm com coming from a civil law country, I mean, um, there are, I mean, administrative bodies with the power to create jurisprudence. I mean, I'm thinking about the case of the US, I mean, the US tax court or the Brazilian tax court. I mean, these are administrative bodies. They are producing case law. Uh, and then comes the judicial case law. And what I can say, the, the big question of the day, the, the hope I want to, to take, I mean, Werner's optimistic view is, why don't we learn from the interaction between administrative case law and judicial case law and transplant that experience to this area? So case law produced by arbitrators <coughs> and case law produced by, by judges. Hopefully, taking Werner's optimistic approach, I mean, they may complement each other rather than compete. I will leave it there. <laughs> There's another question there. Mm -hmm. Just a, one of the unhappiness of uh, map cases is that the taxpayer or the person, the, the business involved, is not involved in the process. So you, you're giving yourself away to something else. And if, if cases are factual, I don't think facts ever live in, in, in their own in isolation. There is always some legal or economic argument behind the facts to which will turn the, the, the argument one way or the other. So. I think it would be better if, if, if it is factual, then the, the people who know about the facts are the businesses themselves. So it seems odd that they're excluded from the process. And actually, I do think, I mean, I think I'm right in saying that some rulings in countries like Australia, there are, there are synopsis of the, of the whatever decision is reached in those cases, and it's helpful to, um, for the other people who are potentially in, in those, going to go into those processes to understand how the process is operates and what the outcome is. So that's, that, that isn't a sort of strictly, that isn't a judgment which is published and you can look at all the facts and look at all the arguments and then sort of see how it actually played out in practice. But it does give you some indication as to how the system will work. And I think one of the, 
one of the worries about the BEPS process is that if you change the rules, as you are doing, then you create a considerable amount of uncertainty as to how those rules will apply to any particular fact, set of facts and circumstances, and you create enormous uncertainty. So the, the, the international community, the international organisations are now sort of falling over themselves to try and sort of get back to some sort of re-established uncertainty. And I think to the extent you've got things in the process now, like MAP, you need to do as much as you possibly can to create as much certainty as you possibly can and to or eliminate as much of the uncertainty as, as you possibly can. And actually, we talked a lot about arbitration, but there are pretty well no arbitration cases at all, except between US and Canada, as far as I'm aware. So arbitration is the sort of Damocles that stands over the people who are negotiating the math process to be told, hurry up. You know, you've got two years or three years, and after that, you've got to go, it's, it's out of your hands. So countries like India don't like that idea because they, they think that gives up sovereignty and therefore they're completely opposed to the idea of arbitration. But it's not, it isn't a process which is in operation anywhere except in, in the North American continent, as far as I'm aware. So we, we've got almost no arbitration cases at all anywhere else, a handful. I mean, you know, John Avery Jones has probably done probably more than anybody, anybody else has done two or three, I think. Yeah, yeah they're just, they're just, they don't exist. So I, th but I do think there's, there are some practical things which I think OECD could steer the world of international tax, if we have got a world of international tax, towards. And I think involving the taxpayer in the process would be very helpful. I think having some means of, of understanding what it is that map, the MAP process has arrived, or the decision they've arrived at, and why they've arrived at it, it's so that you can sort of apply that to your own facts and circumstances, I think would be very helpful. And I think there are precedents in some of the national rulings where this has been done, quite successfully as far as I can understand, so there is a precedent there. That so wasn't a question really, but it was a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I <clears throat> have been wondering uh, recently about the role and attractiveness of confidentiality in Max increasingly. Um, because uh, with all the um, if for example the bets in the best context, all this new information, master file, etc., etc., uh, becomes uh, a, a common practice. Then, why would it be of interest, uh, or sort of a special interest, from the uh, on the part of the multinationals to keep the whole process secret? For example, Vodafone and India have had an ongoing conflict of billions of. Uh, dollars for some years now, almost 10 years. Um, so if they went into map, if they went into arbitration and both Vodafone and the Indian government have approached the issue, almost agreed on arbitration, but backtracked, both of them. Um, so if they agreed on, on map and Vodafone, for example, could show the example or India could show the example, India is having similar uh, problems now with um, uh, Hutchinson, um, uh, based in Hong Kong, and uh, then it, it would be very uh, possible that either party or both parties would gain in a third country if they have a similar problem. And therefore the uh, argument that MAP would, uh, is necessarily a confidential affair and the European directive is different, is correct, but the European uh, directive, uh, EU directive may be much more rational going forward. So I'm wondering why OECD or whether OECD could push this aspect or look into it that if MAP really, I mean, instead of making it optional and so on and so forth, made it a part of the minimum standards and said that it should be open and so on, despite the fact that only 26 countries have signed from what you said. And India certainly is not signing on uh, arbitration. Um, and some important countries like Sweden and others have reservations. But I think that the idea that map, uh, the, that the transparency can actually be helpful to both parties uh, because, of the, because of the needed uh, uh, information input that is going to come forth, I think May, maybe it could be explored more. And the second the question I had, this was a comment, the question I had for Professor Avi Yona was he concluded by saying the next decade there will be more divergence, less coherence. And <laughs> I remember in your last seminar that I went over here, you kind of concluded in the same way. So I'm kind of wondering with all these bets 
approach with the EU, with the, the movement a little bit towards the UN as maybe the source principle or the explanation that you gave, why do you not expect that even within the overall conundrum, there will be areas of equilibrium that would lead overall to some kind of an equilibrating process? Well, as so Ms. Chattel, uh, I, mean, I think in the longer run, I think you're probably right. I think we will eventually get there. I mean, my, you know, my perspective, of course, is you know, very much influenced by what I like to call the single tax principle, that is the notion that double non-taxation is wrong. And this is now, because of BEPS, incorporated in the preamble to the OECD model and through M MLI and PPT incorporated into a lot of treaties and it is even in the new US model and so on. So conceptually, I think as BEPS spreads, the cases like this China, Hong Kong, Canada thing will eventually uh, hopefully be rooted out and that also I think applies to India and Waterford and Hutchinson because I think the thing that the Indians fundamentally object to there is the fact that nobody is going to tax these billions of dollars if they don't get to tax them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but between now and when we get there, I suspect that the, these graphs that I've seen will so, show more divergence simply because, you know, some countries are more eager to go on with this, uh, I mean, just compare the reaction to BEPS in the EU and the US. In the EU, you've got this anti-tax avoidance package and the directive that is binding to all countries starting in 2019, et cetera, et cetera. And it has very tough stuff in it. It has, you know, denial of the, I mean, it would definitely apply to this kind of case. Denial of deduction if there's no inclusion and it has, you know, very, very, you know, very strict PPT and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the EU in the US. You know, the view is, you know, we've already complied with the minimum standards and that's it. And okay, we'll do CBC, but only if it's confidential and we will not share if there's any threat that this will be made public, uh, you know, public in, in, in the other countries. So even that is not entirely sure. And we're not cooperating with CRS, even though that brands us as a tax haven, etc. So, you know, it will take a while before we get coherence. I do believe we will, but, you know, maybe 10 years, something like that. But you as Concluding tax treatment, uh, ratifying tax treatment. No. I know. <laughs> 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 Actually, there, was a, there was a question. Yes. Yeah, really, thanks. Um, Martin, yes, sir. I should begin by saying how much I've enjoyed and, and learned being in this project and uh, uh, beginning from learning the difference between a leading case and a progeny case through to all <laughs> kinds of things. It's been fascinating coming from political science. Um, I, I've been wondering about the kind of combination of three things that I've heard tonight. The first is point that John picked up about the, the bias in the distribution of disputes towards the source country. The second is um, Eduardo's kind of conceptualization of tax competition, essentially, as being partly about the adoption of the OECD legal technology, as you, you call it. So to some extent, countries compete for investment by adopting, by participating more effectively in the regime. And the third is... Uh, is the, the, the notion of tax certainty and arbitration. So I, I looked a, a few years ago at the, the distribution of arbitration clauses in tax treaties, and the two countries with the most in at that point, this is uh, well, well proved EPS, was um, the Netherlands and Switzerland. Uh, and indeed, the Swiss treaties, many of them had most open nation clauses, which seems to me to indicate that for a hub jurisdiction, having arbitration clauses in the treaty may actually be a means of uh, Another, another means of attracting investment to be rooted through your jurisdiction. So I wondered whether what we will see over time is that arbitration clauses will become a tool of tax competition, that in order to, a, a quite a powerful tool, to, or, or, or maybe the other way around, that tax competition will become quite a powerful incentive for states to, that currently have not to adopt arbitration. I, I fully agree with that. My, my feeling is that the non-G20 hubs have they have this a strong incentive to to offer tax arbitration clauses in all their uh, tax treaties. And le let's think about the, the following case. Uh, because of the problems that Brazil has been facing, my feeling is that Brazil will probably accept tax arbitration within the next 10 years because of glo globalization. 
And uh, okay, let's assume a, a Swiss multinational with interest in Brazil. So let's assume that this Swiss multinational requests um, a map and the Brazilian tax authorities are unable to agree with the Swiss tax authorities. So that Swiss multinational will request an arbitration. And it is, I think, highly likely that the arbitrators will be tax advisors at the same time. So um, I think in many cases, th there will be a strong incentive to favor the Swiss multinational, for example. And um, yes, and the system, we, and it, it will be not public. So to, to make the story short, my feeling is that non-G20 hubs will have a, a strong element to offer, particularly in tax treaties uh, with high tax countries. I'm picking up actually on the issue of tax competition and going back to another theme that I think was implicit in what he was saying. Uh, if you have a, well, you were talking about cartels and methods that uh, members, I mean, countries put in place to avoid competing with one another. So would transparency not be a means through which tax competition could be decreased? I, mean, I, I, I agree. Yes. Um, I, I, I think that at the end of the day, we are dealing with an unstable cartel. Uh, meaning that, I mean, countries say one thing, but are actually doing something different because they have the incentive to defect. It's a very stiff competition for capital. So what I can see is an unstable cartel. And tax arbitration, following to, to what Martin said, I think will probably accelerate competition. And will probably make the, the cartel more unstable and may collapse. So in order to, to deter that, that process, as Pablo is now suggesting, one potential way of making this this cartel as stable as possible, because I think it's a, it is a benign cartel, it's a good cartel, is to, to make the behavior of countries as transparent as possible, because they have the incentive to defect. So um, inspired on what Marty and, and Pablo have said, I think it's crucial to, to increase as much transparency as possible in order to bring stability to this unstable cartel. Thank you. Well, the schedule tells me that you were planning to say some concluding thoughts. It's 8 o'clock. <laughs> an interesting discussion. Some people might want to go for dinner, including myself. <laughs> 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 um, the first of all, I would like just to, to thank you for all your ideas. I, I'm sure that many of your ideas will be incorporated in the second edition of, of the book. They have been very illuminating. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to conclude with, with just one I mean, big picture point. Um, globalization, I think, is here to stay. And globalization has both a bright side and a dark side. The bright side is the creation of wealth, the creation of new technologies, I mean, the iPad. So it has a wonderful bright side. But at the same time, it has a dark side, which is increasing inequality. And I think that's a problem that is, we ca can be seen within countries and between countries. And uh, I'm coming from Latin America, which is the most unequal part of the world. And one, one frequent element associated with inequality is political instability. And my feeling is that now the world, because of increasing inequality, is facing that problem at a global scale, political instability. My feeling is that Brexit will probably bring political instability in the UK. Probably Trump will produce also political instability in the US. So the big question is, uh, to what extent the, the international tax regime could be used in order to deal with this, probably the central problem that humanity is now facing, which is inequality? I don't know how to answer that question. But what I, what I see is that uh, one dark side of globalization is increasing inequality. And what I see is that the international tax regime could be an important tool to deal with that probably central problem that humanity is dealing with, inequality. Um, that's an open question. I don't know how to answer it. But what I'm sure is that the international tax regime is one of the most central elements that humanity may use to deal with this problem of inequality.
Thank you very much. Thank you.